Ball State University, a century of progress and still growing. As our university evolves, our impact continues to extend beyond our campus and into our community. Learn about how exciting changes to our facilities will improve the way our students live and learn at Ball State and how we support our friends and neighbors in Muncie and across East Central Indiana next on Cardinal Compass. From the campus of Ball State University on Ball State PBS and Indiana Public Radio, this is Cardinal Compass, campus and community conversations. At Ball State University, we are empowered to seek new insights, unrestrained by convention. We reimagine the future, spread our wings and fly. Lifted by knowledge, enabled across disciplines, we are inspired, engaged, and exhilarated, propelled to change the world, and with beneficence as our guide, at Ball State University, we fly. Hello, welcome to Cardinal Compass. A lot has changed in 100 years, and you can see many of them on the Ball State campus. I'm Delmi Hernandez. And I'm Blake Chapman. Those changes have impacted how people live and learn and love the campus and community. Cherish Nicole looks at some of the dramatic transformation to the landscape. In 1918, the Ball Brothers laid the foundation for the future Ball State University. The college started as the Eastern Division of the Indiana State Normal School. A lot has changed since then. When the school started, the administration building was a place for students to go to class, sleep, and dine all in one place. Today, there's lots of spots across campus for each of those activities. A lot of thought and planning goes into each project. One of the newest additions to Ball State is North Dining. Even being a relatively new extension to the Ball State community, many projects are still in progress. We've got a brand new dining facility, and in preparation for this, uh, myself and the Associate Vice President of Business and Auxiliary Services, Julie Hopwood, and others of our team toured 30 restaurants in Chicago and also toured other universities and colleges to get an idea of what we wanted. Next to what is now the North Dining Hall used to be La Follette Residence Hall. The complex was the largest on campus with 1,900 men and women. Now it looks a lot more green, like much of campus. So to our south, basically, is going to be a green space. And so it will be all grass with some stone benches and it'll just be kind of an area that students can kind of hang out. Oh, how times have changed. Cherish Nicole, Cardinal Compass. Joining us for today's Cardinal Compass, Ball State President Jeffrey Mearns and Jim Lowe, the Associate Vice President for Facilities, Planning, and Management. Thank you both so much for being here. It's good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you again. So COVID-19 has changed the way we live our lives. It's affected it in so many different ways. So how would you say it has affected the plans, designs, and even the master plan? So we're in the process now of taking a look at the master plan. It was approved by our board, I think, in 2015. And Jim is working with the same group that helped develop that plan to update the master plan. And it turned out to be a good timing to do that, given the impact or potential impact of COVID-19 on the future of what facilities for higher education might look like. Right. So it's a question all universities are asking themselves. How do you react to the past events? that's occurred over the last 12 months. And I think most universities are saying, you know, in some ways we will change, in some ways we will not change how we design our buildings. And so I think there'll be more emphasis on how we perhaps uh, venture into our ventilation systems, but more so how we adapt our spaces to be flexible. And we were going to do that anyway. And so part of our strategic plan calls for flexible spaces in our uh, academic buildings and uh, we're going to emphasize that. And they, they take on a lot of different uh, arrangements in, in that regard. So flexible spaces, for, for the most part, is going to be the big emphasis. Speaking yeah. of that master plan, how did it exactly come to fruition? And where are we now? Has it accomplished what you hope so far? 
from my sense, uh, so I inherited the master plan, and Jim can speak to how it was developed, but I think if you saw the progress we've made from the, the master plan in 2015, you can see that Jim and, and the rest mm -hmm. of the folks here on campus have really used that as a great guide to enhance our facilities, Jim. So yeah, going back to your first question, how did it come about? It was actually in 2012, in that time frame, 2013, that the decision was made that we really need a big comprehensive plan for Ball State University. Although we've had a roadmap for years, for decades for that matter, we need a comprehensive plan. And it took two to three years to get there. We wanted to do it right, which was adapted by the, adopted by the board in 2015. But it identified near, mid, and long-term projects and had a big dollar value associated with it. And what's interesting, we've been able to accomplish a good portion of the near and midterm projects that you're seeing actually unfold today as we speak. It just takes time to get there and that's occurred over the last five years. So this next campus master plan will carefully unfold it as well and it will take time for that to develop. Now you mentioned yeah. time. Right. So how have residence halls and dining facilities changed over the last several years and why have these changes been needed? Well, so the, and the residence halls that are now being completed on the north side of our campus are a product of that master plan. And I think, as Jim can explain, mm -hmm. there's even more flexibility in those designs. There's some traditional elements, but also, as you know, they're living learning communities in those facilities as well. C correct. So as the President Mearns mentioned, the residence hall today is different because there's a lot of multiple uses of multiple spaces within those buildings. So we brought in the concept of living learning communities within those residence halls. And as such, we've got a lot of spaces. It could be maker spaces, could be uh, wellness sort of areas and so forth. Uh, of course, you, you're familiar with the themes that we use with our residence halls, but just bringing newness to those facilities is, is very helpful. And what's interesting is we actually thought 20 some years ago that the student would want singles and their own privacy. The students really want a roommate. And so we've adopted the fact that we're gonna to continue to have double occupancy sort of rooms, but those multiple use spaces that the students can use uh, as they're staying in their residence halls. And dining facilities have, have adopted the fact that there's a different cuisine today different and for wellness purposes and so forth and so the students want multiple ways of which they can um, to use those facilities uh, the dining facilities and the, and the residence halls so yeah awesome yes thank you so much for saying both of that mm -hmm. and not only do students live differently in 2021 they learn differently when Ball State started radio was new and there was no TV and definitely no internet <laughs> technology has come a long way Blake Dollier shows us how Ball State's newest academic buildings are transforming the way students learn. I've uh, been really fortunate and blessed in my career to be a part of a lot of pretty exciting things. Um, but as far as Ball State goes, this, this absolutely tops them all. Finishing the chapter and turning the page to a new beginning. With new buildings, a safe walkway to downtown, and renovations campus-wide. Well, anything compared to Cooper is an improvement. Um, that building is pretty tired. Ball State Foundational Science Building is set to open fall of 2021, meaning students can begin their educational journeys as soon as next year. And the massive facility is nothing shy of groundbreaking. I started here on the ground level and walked all the way up to the top floor and eventually the roof to cover every square inch of the new facility. We just walked really two blocks. Really? Yep. Wow. A lengthy building closer to the village aiming to boost local businesses and taking feedback from students that they gave about Cooper Science and applying it to help improve their college experience. Um, when they do programming of a building is to try to take all that feedback uh -huh. um, in order to produce the best design New building. The multicultural center is also moving over by Bracken Library and Pruis Hall. It's, it's, it's bittersweet um, because there's a lot of history in this building. Um, there's also a, um, a, a part where a part of us that will always be here in this space. These changes, all with the same goal in mind, a stronger campus community. Blake Dollier, Cardinal Compass. Oh, so these will be the balcony. So we do have new educational buildings coming in. So what new avenues can we see from these buildings being built and what opportunities will they provide for students? 
Well, so you've seen the two new buildings that are going up on the East Academic Quad, the new Health Professions Building, which has been open for about 18 months, and then the Foundational Sciences Building, which will open this summer. They're going to be linked through by that East Mall. They're going to be linked more closely to the village. We hope that that will encourage students and faculty and staff to take advantage of opportunities in the village. But as Jim can explain, that East Mall will run through the heart of campus, uh, past the new Grand Lawn, and then ultimately up to the Recreation Center. Yes, so we've accomplished a good 60% of that East Mall build out. But what's really great about what we're doing is we're also collaborating with the community. So when we build our pathways and our walkways through the campus, we do align with, with the, the city of Muncie and what they're doing in that regard. So when finished, the East Mall will connect with the Martin Street pathway. It will take you down to the, uh, the river and the bicycle path at that location. So you know, we're trying to connect all our opportunities on campus with those with the community as well. When you're talking about pathways and, and avenues and so forth. Yeah. Now right. and, and one of the things, yeah. so what I like to say is, once that East Mall <laughs> is completed, and as, you, as Jim Correct. was saying, connected to the street, you're going to be able to ride a bicycle from our campus recreation right. center on a dedicated bike path to the White River Greenway, to the Cardinal Greenway, and all the way to Richmond, Indiana. Yeah. Now you'll be able to do that and Jim will be able to do that. The <laughs> distance is too large for me, but it's a great way, as Jim was saying, the connectivity yeah. of our right. campus to the community and right. to the natural resources that exist throughout our region. No, obviously that sounds wonderful, but I think a question that both students and parents would really want to know is how does allocating that money for construction projects work? Does it depend on the number of students in a major or is it more so to try to get more students into those facilities? and for those materials for them to succeed. Yeah, so there's really two different sources of funding. For our academic buildings, we're quite fortunate that the state of Indiana has invested approximately $210 million in the Health Professions Building, in the Foundational Sciences Building, and then the third phase, which is the complete rehabilitation of Cooper Science. So we're grateful to uh, the General Assembly and the governor for those investments. For our other buildings, they depend at least on our own resources right. and housing and dining revenue mm -hmm. supports the construction and maintenance of residence halls and dining halls. And then for our upgrades of our athletics facilities, a lot of that depends upon the support of our donors and supporters. So it's really two or three different streams of, of resources. Yeah, so building off of what the President mentioned, decades ago, three, four decades ago, there were those who were good stewards of our finances who put aside out of uh, revenue sources that came from residence halls and dining facilities, 3% of that revenue that built up over time. And by virtue of that good financial stewardship, we have the ability to build the North residential neighborhood that we're building, the new dining facilities. We renovate our buildings. Certainly you can't do it all at one time. You have to spread it out. But by having that resource along with the good uh, resources that come from the state of Indiana for academic buildings and the donor base that helps us as well. That's why we're able to do what we're able to do, which is wonderful. Certainly with wonderful. those, it is wonderful, yeah. <laughs> with those yeah. new living learning communities, new residence halls coming in, um, what benefits do you believe those living learning communities can provide for students by living closer to those educational buildings, such as Woodworth and the Health Professions mm -hmm. Building? Right. So living learning communities, you know, this is a relatively new concept and we've been on the forefront of that. You know, a couple years ago when I was in college, there really were two distincts. You were in your residence halls or you were in your academic buildings or the libraries. And what we know is if we're going to engage our students better, we want to fuse the two together. We want to have educational opportunities and experiences within the residence halls and that that improves that particularly that uh, experience for incoming first year and second year students and then of course the and this goes to Jim's planning the living learning communities that are being incorporated into the residence halls are aligned with the academic buildings that are coming online and that's mm -hmm. just again that's just the product of outstanding uh, planning for the future and so built into our campus master plan to this topic um, is the framework that the campus will have as center core the academic administrative buildings. It may not be apparent to folks until you sit down and go, oh yeah, I get it. So the center part of campus is the academic administrative core. It's really the perimeter where we have the living and learning communities just on the outside so they can walk in comfortably, mm -hmm. but they can then leave and feel like they're off campus into their, their, their environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Now one major part of the future is what's 
happening on the south side of campus and in the village. More and more activity is moving in that direction, and Brandon Carson tells us many business owners are welcoming the university's attention. The village is a staple of Muncie and for Ball State students to explore. Village Green Records owner Travis Harvey says it's part of the community he believes everyone can enjoy. We cater to, I would say, a, on average, like 13-year-old to 70-year-old range. I mean, so any day, a very wide range of people walk in here. Harvey says he wants to see the university get more involved. But Ball State doesn't really, I don't think they really terribly have to do very much deliberate on their part to make a difference, and nor have they ever. While Harvey is thriving, David Barnett had to make some changes to his business. He's the owner of Wizard's Keep, a game store which has been open since 1984. The shop stayed in the village until 2012, but then moved to White River Plaza. Uh, we couldn't really find the space that we needed in the Ball State Village. However, Barnett says the issues extend beyond the space inside. The second big issue that we really had in the Ball State Village was parking. Uh, we had a lot of issues with customers being towed. And as some business owners hope BSU gets more involved, Harvey is encouraged with the progress he feels has been made so far. I would say in the recent, like, last five, six years, there seems to be a push for Ball State to help out the community and, and become a member of the community by hosting, like, events and having festivals down in this region. And he hopes the university can help keep students in the region after they graduate. Maybe they could provide more tax incentives or something like that to try to help promote. Maybe they could have a better relationship with a lot of students to try to keep them in the area with grants and things. Brandon Carson, Cardinal Compass. Of course, a lot of new projects moving forward for Ball State. Now, the first question we'll ask in this portion, what does Ball State hope to see from a connection with the village? What's in the works and is there a timetable? Well, and certainly there is a clear connection. And for folks who grew up in Muncie or attended Ball State uh, years ago, the, the village was a vibrant asset for people who were on campus. And we know that for the future, people want to see a revitalized village. So we are in the process of engaging with an external development partner to help us uh, craft a vision, really a master plan, long-term master plan to revitalize the village. That time frame is going to take a while because it's a pretty complex project and because, as Jim said a moment ago, that project in particular, it will be important for us to engage the community. That is, the, the owners of the shops, the, the people who run those current restaurants, and also we want to attract people not just from the university to go to the village, but we want to attract people from throughout the region to come to the village as well. So it will be a slow process, but you're going to start to see some changes over the next couple of years. Mm. Fantastic. So on to another project that we've heard a lot about, which is the Multicultural Center. I actually walked right by it this morning. So what impact do you believe it will have on students? So I think it's going to have a profound impact. Um, moving that facility, that important facility, from the perimeter of campus right. to the center of campus, to the heart of campus, will ensure that all students have ready access to the programs and activities and offerings that exist there. And grateful to Jim for helping us locate, find that site. And you can see it's strategically located right off the East Mall. So there is a lot of invitation and excitement from the village, from the community to come into the center of campus, which will be even more exciting with the multicultural center and the amphitheater that we'll build in that central location. And it's much needed, mm. much needed. But what will happen mm. to the former multicultural center once the new one's built? Well, that is a house that uh, we will eventually tear down but what we're working on is a way to memorialize the fact that that was the Multicultural Center. So one of the proposals, I propose that we make that a green space. Could be a couple benches out there, could be an area where you could just sit and maybe a plaque to uh, memorialize the fact that that's where that building was located. And we're even talking about how you transition from that location to the new location with some event. Mm. So. Yeah. Um, I know the amphitheater was just mentioned not long ago, mm -hmm. so with that amphitheater, what impact will that have on the students and the university as well? Well, certainly it'll be an opportunity for our students in music and theater and other performing arts to use that as a venue. I predict, though, even when we don't have organized activities there, that students will take advantage of that resource for their own informal activities or student organization activities. And also, Charlie Brown, who is the principal donor that is making this amphitheater possible, 
was also very insistent right. that that amphitheater be a resource for the community. Mm -hmm. So we can imagine working with the Muncie, Muncie Symphony Orchestra, mm -hmm. the Muncie Civic Theater to bring their programs and their performances to that amphitheater, which will allow our students and our faculty and staff to see the cultural resources that exist in the community off campus. So it's going to be a great it's going to be a great resource and it's a wonderful design. Yes, yeah, so to President's point, he, uh, he emphasized the need for community involvement. He also emphasized the need for student involvement. So besides being a venue that could be used for music and theater and dance, it's also a venue that can be used for any student organization. It could be used for orientation. It could be used for any event that the students want to hold in that Grand Lawn area that will be created along with the amphitheater. Wow. Nice. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Uh, Jim Lowe, we want to thank, thank you, you again for joining us. And President Mearns, we would like to give you the final minute to hear your thoughts on today's conversation. Well, thank you for the opportunity to visit with you, and I want to express my appreciation to Jim and his team. They do a wonderful job. You know, our campus, our facilities are one of the many uh, distinctive attributes of our university. And as Jim mentioned, we are the beneficiaries of people who have come before us, who have managed our resources, who have designed and developed these facilities over the years. And it's important for me and for all of us who presently serve to be uh, good stewards of those resources and to also then to refine and enhance that vision going forward. So it was uh, really wonderful to have an opportunity to share that good work and the important work that we're doing to enhance the educational experience and co-curricular experience for our students. Fantastic. Again, we want to thank President Mearns and our guest Jim Lowe and all of you for joining in on the conversation. I'm Delmi Hernandez. And I'm Blake Chapman. We hope you'll join us next time for Cardinal Compass, campus and community conversations. Stay safe out there. You know you're a Ball State Cardinal when you first hear the chirp, when you look to Frog Baby for luck and Beneficence for guidance. You're a Ball State Cardinal when you chase your dreams, present your case, and win. When the university you call home is small enough to be a community, but big enough to change the world. You know you're a Ball State Cardinal when you're one of us. We are Ball State University. We fly.